thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here talking to Matt. I've been a fan of Matt's work. He's one of my intellectual heroes for a long time since the origins of virtue. Um, he is the supreme synthesis of our age, I think, for getting so many different fields together. And The Rational Optimist, I think, is his best work yet. Um, and, and I love this, you know, the, uh, the idea uh, of ideas having sex is a great concept. Uh, before we explore it, I just want to ask, are there any videos? We can see. <laughs> well, why don't you briefly explain to us what the concept of ideas having sex? And, and, you yeah. know, the, the big theme of my book is that innovation comes from exchange, basically, mm -hmm. from, from people swapping things and ideas, um, uh, is that it's equivalent to sex. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this, and at one point we were going to call the book, you know, When Ideas Have Sex and things like that. but. Um, we took a vote on that, Jerry, didn't we, at, at, that, <laughs> at that meeting, and it was thought a little too facetious. Um, uh, and there have, there have been places in the world where I've gone to give talks, and the organizers have said, great, really want to hear about your book, but can we ask you one thing? Don't use that phrase when <laughs> ideas have sex. It might shock our audience. <laughs> uh, much more than we realize. Innovation, experimentation, uh, cultural advance comes from uh, people swapping, th well, people swapping things as well as ideas. And I can come back mm -hmm. to this because actually I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue that people, people think that what I mean is just people getting together in a bar and mm -hmm. underground in New York and, and <laughs> talking to each other. Mm -hmm. I don't really mean that actually. I mean technology. I mean the fact that every technology we possess has, has ideas that occur to different people in different times and different places in it. Uh, and that actually what embodies the, you know, where, where, se where ideas have sex is in technologies. Mm -hmm. And the people driving this, uh, um, um, intellectuals and politicians like to think that scientists like to think they're driving the process of innovation. Of course, politicians like to claim credit for it. But in your book, you, talk, uh, uh, um, you give the credit elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm persuaded that, that this is all a much more bottom-up process than we all think that because of Nobel Prizes and the patent system and the newspapers, we give far too much credit to individuals mm. for innovations. Mm. And that all of them actually are, are simply standing on the shoulders of lots of other people. Um, and that most innovation happens by perspiration, not inspiration. In other mm. words, it's, it's tinkering people doing technologies rather than geniuses in ivory mm. towers. And one of my problems is getting this idea across in academia. They don't like it. <laughs> they think it's all about geniuses. And, and they think what I mean is that the more people share, the, the more people there are, because mm -hmm. it's also a demographic phenomenon that I'm talking mm -hmm. about. You know, the more people are talking to each other, the more innovation you're gonna, is going to happen. The more people there are, the more chance there is of one of them being a genius. That's the, that's the common meme out there that everybody thinks that you mean by this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't mean that at all. I actually, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, the, the, the outlier theory, I call mm -hmm. it, and, and academics just can't leave that one alone. They because they're the outliers. They're the right? outliers, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry. But you, also give a <laughs> <laughs> but you also give a lot of credit to uh, the reviled traders and businessmen who, you know, who tend to get blamed for exploiting people and, and and for and for being social parasites, where you know, whereas you see them as a source, these traders going back, of course, to the, you know, you know, back to the times of the Stone Age when people were trading tools and things, right? Yeah, I mean, I I, I do think that the invention of trade was the key ingredient that kicked off the, the process that led to civilization and everything. We had huge brains before that. Mm -hmm. Neanderthals had huge brains, um, and you know, we had. Um, love and insight and jealousy and you know all these sort of weird things you know, empathy mm. i'm sure we had all that kind of stuff but until we had trade you just couldn't get cumulative accelerating technological evolution mm -hmm. um uh, and so so it, you know t if you go back and look wh where do we know where 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 is the great flowerings of invention and discovery mm -hmm. They're in trading nations. They're in 17th century Holland or Renaissance Italy or ancient Greece or Abbasid Arabia or, or Tang China. You know, so Fibonacci, for example, mm -hmm. is one of my favorite examples. The guy who brought numerals, you know, mm -hmm. the Indian numeral system that we all use, they thought it was Arabians because he got it from the Arabians, but actually the Arabians had got it from the Indians. Mm -hmm. um, he brought that to Europe. And um, uh, why? Well, because his dad was a Genoese, no, a Pisan trader mm -hmm. living in North Africa, talking to Arabs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so, uh, so, so 
just stop knocking traders. They're great people. They do wonderful things. <laughs> in the book, you've got this, you know, just wonderful array of evidence from, you know, from from Tierra del Fuego, from you know, you know, isolated islands that, and uh, and throughout the world and throughout history. Has there been uh, new evidence since you know since you've done the book for those of us who, who, know, who know what's in the book? Or? Yeah, I was very excited by uh, a couple of things that that came out. One was a really nice model-based study of what happened in Africa uh, after about 160,000 years ago, mm -hmm. between that and about 60,000 years ago, because you get because you get these sudden flowerings of, of really sophisticated technology in Africa as long as 160,000 years ago, at a place called Pinnacle Point in South Africa, etc. You get, you get suddenly an elaboration of tools that you just didn't see before that. Um, and then it fades away again, then it happens again, then it comes, you know, it comes and goes. And then finally it kind of breaks out around 60,000 years ago and spreads around the world and never stops expanding. Mm -hmm. um, so what's happening in Africa before that? Um, and these guys at University College of London have basically said that the best explanation is demographic, that what you're essentially seeing is that because these people were living on the coast and were living off shellfish, they were able to, to generate really quite large populations, quite dense populations. And so it's a demographic phenomenon. The more people there are, the more chance you've got the specialized skills to start developing these tools. And then what happens is there's climate change or something and they disappear. I mean, the, you know, the, the population density collapses again and, the, and then the, the technology disappears as well. Mm -hmm. And s along the same lines, there's a very nice study by two guys at UCLA of Pacific fishing tackle from before Western continent. Uh, and basically, the, the, the bigger the island, the more sophisticated the, ta the fishing tackle, which is this demographic there's phenomenon. more ideas having but also them. if you control for size of island the the proximity to other islands and the amount of trading contact gives you more sophisticated so so uh, isolated islands have more simple technologies mm -hmm. so in other words what's driving innovation is not how clever you you are in the room it's how many other rooms you're in contact with Mm -hmm. and, the t and the Tasmanian example, which I do have in the book, is just this spectacular example of this, that when Tasmania became isolated 10,000 mm -hmm. years ago, not only did it not share in the technologies that came along in Australia after that, because it mm -hmm. was out of contact with them, so the boomerang, mm -hmm. for example, never reached Tasmania, but it actually regressed, mm -hmm. it actually gave up technologies. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that 4,000 people was just too small a collective brain to sustain the specialized skills you need mm -hmm. and the exchange patterns you mm -hmm. need to to keep, keep these technologies mm -hmm. alive. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting sort of thesis in here, which, and I can't get, I mean, so economists like it, but they're not that interested in the archeology. span The archeologists on the whole just aren't interested. They want to talk about um, culture and things. They don't really want to talk about anything economic because it sounds mm -hmm. too dirty and trade-like. <laughs> um, uh, and the biologists aren't very interested because they want to talk about genes, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it, it it's an idea I, I, I want to, to mm -hmm. keep hammering away at. And the contrast you had was the Tierra del Fuego, which was also an island about the yeah. same size, and, 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 uh, uh, but it was more closely connected. It was, it was a yeah. narrow strait to the mainland, right? Yeah, the Magellan Strait is quite narrow, and there was trading contact across it the whole time, whereas the Bass Strait, there was no trading contact across right. it for those 10,000 years that um, Tasmania was an island. Uh, and so the, the Yagan and the other Indians on, on uh, Tierra del Fuego they got things like the bow and arrow and all sorts of other technology. Mm -hmm. They got them from South America. So mm -hmm. it's a good example of how you know, they had a continent-sized mm -hmm. collective brain to call on, and we've got, and they had, a, and the Tasmanians mm -hmm. didn't. And of course, the implication of all this is that we've now got a planet-sized collective brain thanks mm -hmm. to the internet, mm -hmm. and that must be accelerating the rate of innovation, mm -hmm. um, uh, because an idea in Shanghai can have sex with an idea in San Francisco mm -hmm. uh, in ten seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas a hundred years ago it took six weeks or something. Yeah. Um, and and I just sort of feel in my bones that 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 must, I mean, sure there are people who are left out, and I'm sure the internet is going to get balkanized into different areas and so on. But but nonetheless, the the possibility for that the number of people involved in this collective brain is bigger than ever, isn't mm -hmm. it? And that must that mm -hmm. must be going to accelerate the rate of um, innovation. The counter argument to that, which I sometimes toy with, is that that's fine for areas where innovation can help, like communication recently, the last 50 years communication has seen these mm -hmm. incredible advances. 
But transport hasn't really. You know, we all thought in the 50s that transport would go surging ahead and we'd all be having personal gyrocopters and routine right. space travel by now, and it didn't happen. So transport hit diminishing returns, hit a brick wall. So maybe all we're doing is accelerating the idea sex within communication and biotechnology and a few other fields, which and we'll get to the point where communication costs so little um, that it's just irrelevant to everyday life. It's sort of, it's free. Mm -hmm. It's like the air we breathe. Mm -hmm. And at that point, all your budget is going on things that where ideas can't have sex, like government and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, looking after the elderly and mm -hmm. things like this, where you can't see the productivity mm -hmm. improvements. So, mm -hmm. so that I call this the high-hanging fruit argument that you know we mm -hmm. may, perhaps all this enables us to do, all the internet enables us to do, is to pluck the low-hanging fruit quicker, mm -hmm. and we're left with the areas of, of, it, it's a version of Baumol's disease. You, mm -hmm. You're more educated than me, John, so you'll know <laughs> what that is. But, the, the idea, we, um, Baumol had this notion that, um, uh, well, basically that, that that some things are less easy to see cost reductions in, yeah, because they're more labour intensive, mm -hmm. and you're sort of left with the ones that are that are, mm -hmm. that are tough to innovate. In. Well, Matt Welch, who's here tonight, has made, has made the argument with Nick that of, that of course the transport in these areas or where the government has taken over, that's where there's no progress, that's where we feel so stifled. And, it's, and, and I guess the question is, can ideas have sex in, uh, enough to overcome that obstacle, to somehow yeah. shove the government aside to work around it? Well, um, I, I mean, I I mean you kind of work around the postal service. That was a monopoly that just yeah. sat there, and now, yeah. fortunately, we just don't, we don't care anymore. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good example. But, okay, two hours ago, I was standing at JFK, having landed <laughs> from London, and there was a... Uh, line, you know, yeah. like this, um, and there were empty desks all the way along, <laughs> <laughs> and there were sort of five guys dealing with 700 people from yeah. uh, all over the world, and it took about an hour and ten minutes to get through immigration. Yeah. Um, and not only was there no incentive for anyone behind those desks to feed back the information that yeah. this, I mean, you know, Walmart treats you like that, and it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yet th there was n not only there was the no feedback, but there was no way of, you know, if, if I had gone up to, if when I got to the front, if I'd said mm. to the very nice guy behind the desk who stamped my passport, if I'd said, um, um, why does it take an hour and a half? And couldn't you get a few more people, you know, on yes. when you know there's several flights arriving? Yeah. I'd be in, you know, on whatever that island is where you go. Right. <laughs> Spread eagled against the wall, <laughs> <laughs> naked. <laughs> so you know, so the feedback mechanisms are not there in the public sector. Right. Be one of my arguments. But you've um, argued in the book, I think, when you said that, uh, the danger that that some of this process will stop the government, that, that there are processes that can stop this, this sort of exchange of ideas. But your hope, you say in the book, is is that there will be. Um, that even if it's even if one place manages to stop it, like you know the way China closed itself in at one point, that that, that there'll always be some other place. Is uh, th this is both a, a, a cause for optimism, but it's also just a tiny bit of a worry, because um, uh, you know when China screwed up, and you know China was roaring ahead of the rest of the world in in terms of technology and living standards and everything in about well about a thousand years ago. Um, and basically what happened was the Ming emperors came along and shut the whole system down. It was mm. bureaucracy that shut it down. You know, mm -hmm. they, they banned trade, which is not a great start. Um, they told merchants that they had to send the mandarins uh, an inventory of their um, stocks every month, you know, and that kind of thing. You know, and they weren't allowed, they had, per, they had to get permission to, uh, a trader had to get permission to go from one town to another. You know, well and they had to offer contraceptives, I think, too. <laughs> didn't they? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So, so you know, China drops the ball, mm -hmm. uh, and Europe picks it up. And Europe's advantage at that point is that it's um, it's it, 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 you can't unify Europe. Mm -hmm. um, Napoleon had a go, Hitler had a go, Charles V had a go. It's impossible. Too many peninsulas, too many mountain ranges. The way you can China. Right. China's because of the rivers that run right through the middle. It's quite easy to unify China. And so Europe never had one government <laughs> till now, um, and, <laughs> and um, 
and as a consequence, it always had different jurisdictions. This was David Hume's theory, actually, mm -hmm. about why Europe was overtaking mm -hmm. China. Um, it ha had different jurisdictions. And if you look at the careers of all, almost any innovator in Europe, people like Gutenberg or, or others, mm -hmm. they, they, they move. Mm -hmm. You know, they move. They, they say, "I don't like the way this ruler is treating me. I'm going to go and live in someone else's mm -hmm. thing." So that was terribly important for Europe. Now, why Europe hadn't got its act together before, I don't know. I suppose it's just too cold and wet or something. But, um, uh, but Renaissance Italy kept the flame alive when Arabia dropped the ball. Now, Arabia dropped the ball not because of bureaucracy so much as because of superstition, in my mm -hmm. view. In other words, it, you know, it burnt all the books and it turned its back on mm -hmm. open inquiry. But it had kept the flame of knowledge alive. You know, mm -hmm. so. So, so far we've been lucky. Someone's kept this, this catalaxy in Hayek's mm -hmm. word, this habit of exchanging ideas and, and, and being free and open and trading. Someone's kept it going somewhere. And at the moment, you know, there's no risk of it dying out. The Chinese mm -hmm. or the Indians or the Americans or someone is going to keep it going. But, you know, just suppose we, we did a China, we did a sort of Ming Empire to the world this time. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose we said, right, we're going to regulate all trade on the grounds that we want to make it uh, fair, or, yeah, exactly. yeah. or yeah. green, or, or make green it green, or whatever. Right, yeah. Exactly. And of course, that's what you see. I mean, that's what yeah. you're going to hear a lot of at Rio in, in a yeah. couple of months' time. Um, it, is the notion that trade is bad for the environment, which is clearly not the case. But right. um, you know, it, at this point, do we not have a plan B? Do we not have a, a reserve planet to keep it going? You know, is, it, yeah. are, is there a worry that there's somewhere on this, there isn't somewhere on this world that can keep the habit going? Mm -hmm. I'm not very worried about that, but mm -hmm. just a tiny bit of me might be. Do you have any thoughts about, uh, I know, uh, what's been the reaction to, um, to your promotion of, the, uh, of this open exchange and trade and, and uh, I mean, what are the hurdles you see to get in this idea and embrace more? Because intellectuals are some of the people who really don't like this, who, who seem to be most against this idea of, yeah. of unregulated. My book's gone down like a lead balloon in academia. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and they, always, they get hung up on sort of particular things. So, so for example, I make the argument that, that the habit of exchange is unique to human beings. And, I, and I'm very careful, I qualify, and I say, well, what I mean is exchange between strangers. You know, exchange between kin, sure, there's some of that goes on in, in, mm -hmm. in ant colonies or in mated pairs of birds or whatever. Uh, and I say, I'm not talking about reciprocity. I'm not talking about one baboon scratches one baboon's back and the other scratches the other one's back. I'm talking about exchanging different things. You know, mm -hmm. I've got fish, you've got meat. Mm -hmm. um, I've got fruit, you've got bread, or whatever it might be. I've got money, you've got beer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and as Adam Smith famously said, no man ever saw a dog make fair and deliberate exchange of a bone <laughs> with another dog. And when I say that, I mean, I gave a, a lecture at University College London um, uh, a couple of months ago, and, and all these professors, they put up their hand one by one, and one said, um, well, there are some ant colonies <laughs> where there is a low degree of relatedness. And I was about to ask exchange. you about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, you know, right, fair enough. <laughs> and then there was another one who said Neanderthals did exchange. Objects move long distances. So I said, really? And he, and he said, yep, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, have you got a paper on that? Because I've got all this, these papers saying that they didn't. And it'd be interesting. Well, I heard it at a seminar about uh, <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> well, can you give me a No, but it definitely happened, you know. <laughs> so, in, in a sense, my phrase is wrong. It's not ideas. I mean, ideas do have sex. And, mm -hmm. you know, your ideas are having sex with my ideas at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it, the exchange is of objects. The exchange that leads to it is of objects. You know, I give you money, you give me beer. You know, mm -hmm. that's what leads to ideas having sex. It's not the fact that we are, I mean, sure, there's a linguistic exchange mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. but I think more important, and, and everyone very, in academia, everyone's very interested in the evolution of language and, mm -hmm. and the degree to which we exchange ideas through language. But I'm saying there's another thing going on, which is that, that um, I make what I'm good at and you make what you're good at and, and we embody lots of different ideas in the things we make. So we end up with, you know, a pencil, which, as 
mm. Leonard Reed famously yeah. said, nobody on the planet knows how to make. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, there isn't a single human being who knows how to make a pencil, because mm -hmm. the man who runs the pencil company only knows how to run a company, and the mm -hmm. man who cuts down trees in Oregon doesn't know how to mine graphite in Sri, Sri Lanka, and so on. You know, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, so this, this notion that the, the, the focus on material technology isn't of interest to academia on mm -hmm. the whole, and it's where my interest mm -hmm. primarily is. I'd like to thank Matt Ridley uh, very much and also John Tierney for the interview. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.